means it is time for the call. 10 stocks, which you suggest, a panel of two experts, 60 minutes, and we whip through them. Delighted to have two of my favourite panellists on, um, on the call with us today. Michael Wayne from Medallion Financial in our Brangaroo studios. Michael, good to see you again. Good to be back. All right, let's get into our 10 stocks on the call today that you've sent through. Let's go from an oil company, um, Andrew, to one of the darlings of the market, CSL, the old Commonwealth Serum Laboratory. <laughs> CSL, um, for us, is our biggest position in the, the uh, model portfolio that we run. The hardest mm-hmm. thing that we've had for clients is getting new clients in because the price obviously keeps moving higher. Right. And ostensibly, it doesn't look cheap, but it's a great business across all different calculations. Yeah. Um, basically, 85% of its revenue comes from its blood plasma business, um, 15%, around 15% is more from sort of flu vaccines, haemophilia vaccines, etc. But its size, its scale, its history in the blood plasma space gives it a competitive advantage over yeah. all its competitors. It's a, it's a lower, business, is it? It's distribution platforms across the world. They're the lowest yeah. cost producer globally of blood plasma. Um, they're the only one that has blood plasma products across the five different blood protein types. Um, they're able to collect the blood and extract more plasma per litre than any of their competitors. This current environment could actually end up being wow. quite good for them because uh, I know it's not a nice thing to say, but more people are unemployed. They'll be keen to raise an extra dollar here or there, so they'll go and donate blood right. more often, which will put down pressure on collection costs, for instance. Um, so CSL does look expensive on sort of 45, 50 times earnings, but you have to understand this is a company that piles so much into research and development and the way that they recognise that R&D on the balance sheet, they, they realise it initially, so in that initial year yeah. that they spend on research and development, where a lot of companies across numerous industries yeah. will spread that out over a decade, that R&D expense. So if you actually... So they're very conservative. So, so they're very conservative, and the research and development way that that's accounted for puts a lot of downward pressure on earnings, which inflates the PE ratio, which makes uh-huh. it look a lot worse than it is. Uh-huh. It's still expensive if you strip that out, but not near as expensive okay. as it looks. So... For us, um, any pullback sort of below, you know, 290, 280, we'd be looking to jump in. All right, so tick for CSL. Um, uh, uh, we've got a really great collection of stocks uh, today to look at. A bit of a bent towards, uh, towards health and, and health tech, and then some interesting ones uh, towards the end, some small ones. So a great mixture today. Thank you for sending them in. Um, our second stock, and we'll uh, kick off with you, I'll... Uh, Michael on this one, Fisher and Paykel, the I should have said it with a New Zealand accent, I suppose, uh, the Kiwi white goods manufacturer. Yeah, but I think this is Fisher and Paykel Healthcare, healthcare. the one yeah. that's listed in Australia. Oh, that's right, healthcare it is. So it's yeah. very different to what people normally assume from the Fisher and Paykel brand yep. name. This is actually one that we've had in the, the model portfolio since inception as well um, in the healthcare space. People often get it confused with ResMed yeah. um, in saying that it's exposed to the sleep apnea space um, and market, but that's only a portion of their business. Um, About 70% of their business comes from the respiratory and acute care market. So if you think about hospitals, all the plastic tubing, um, respiratory um, defibrillators, masks, and and all that sort of consumable products, once it's used on one individual, it can't be used again. So they've got a, they get nice recurring revenue out of that business. And they've got about a 70% market share in that space globally. So every time you go into the hospital, you get a, an oxygen mask, something like that. More often than not, it's actually Fisher and Paykel Healthcare. I didn't realise it was so big on it's, the international scale. It is. It's a, a brilliant business. Their balance sheet looks very good across all the key metrics, revenue growth, earnings growth, margins expanding. Um, they recently moved a lot of their manufacturing operations to Mexico, away mm-hmm. from New Zealand and places like that. And that actually helped boost their margins quite oh, significantly. Yeah. And they managed to pull that off. So often companies will look to cut costs and build factories elsewhere around the world, but they might have a few issues in pulling it off. But Fisher and Paykel managed to do that quite well. Um, in this environment, they've had a, the added boost because everyone's looking for um, respiratory, what do they yep. call it? The defibrillators, et cetera. Not the defibrillators, what has everyone been going yeah, to? Ventilators. The ventilators, yep. sorry. Had a mental blank. And everyone's yep. been looking for that um, ventilators in this environment because of the coronavirus. So they've had that added boost. But even before the coronavirus, this was a business on a great trajectory. Um, earnings upgrades, the reporting cycle was very good for them. So we continue to like this business going forward as well. Oh. However, we are cautious that because it's done so well throughout this negative period, yeah. when the markets actually do start to recover, it might get left behind oh. by the catch-up in some other names. So 
For us, Fisher & Pike is probably a hold at the moment, but in terms right. of the quality of the business, um, right. it's up there, maybe not as high as CSL, but its balance sheet's very, very wow, good. that's interesting, isn't it? Well, it's the third stock where you're really pulling out the big guns here in terms of uh, the health sector. Uh, Cochlear, uh, Michael, again, another yep. great Australian business, great technology. Yep. It's not one that we own. It's one that we have in the years gone by, but haven't for some time because it is quite expensive. Um, it's... Look, I was asked on this show actually a few weeks ago about it and it was sort of a hold to leading towards a buy given the pullback that we've had. Yeah. We've had a chance to go away and look into the business in a bit more detail just to see what we're feeling given the pullback that it's had. Um, basically, what concerns us is that the developed markets, um, children's aspect of the business historically has been the most profitable. But that part of the business now is quite mature. Developed markets mm. have the cash. Children who require the implant have received it, um, which leaves the growth areas adults getting the implants, but also developing markets. But the problem with developing markets is it's a lot more sensitive to price and Cochlea has to compete on price, which means that it's a lower margin right. part of their business going forward. So although the volumes might be there going forward, the margins on these new markets probably won't be as attractive. So the product mix for us isn't as appealing as it once was. Don't get me wrong, it's an unbelievable business. Yeah. You tend to get a patient for life once they've had the implant, they tend to get upgrades every five, 10 years or so. They purchase accessories. Um, historically, any competition, serious competition that, that's emerged has fallen by the wayside once people realize the quality difference between Cochlear and whoever they're competing with. So there's a lot of good attributes about this business, but we're just a little bit concerned that going forward, their most yeah. profitable part of the business um, will struggle and some of the more profitable parts of the business will grow, but they're not as yeah, attractive. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. They we, don't have the same we would have a hold. His history suggests that big pullbacks on Cochlear tend to be good buying opportunities. Right. Going back sort of almost probably seven, eight years ago, they had a big product recall. The share price had a huge drop at that point. Yeah. Then it found the base and recovered quite nicely. They recently raised some capital at a fairly attractive price and saw a big bounce off that. So their balance sheet's in good order. At the moment, they're not doing many um, day surgeries or people aren't obviously doing elective surgeries across the globe at the moment. So that's gonna hurt their business in the short term, but their balance sheet is in a position to withstand that and get okay. them through this period. All right, now let's continue the, uh, the health sector uh, spree with our, our fourth uh, health stock, Sonic Healthcare. Michael? Uh, look, it's, it's not a bad business by any means, but we've just touched on probably you know, three of the best quality healthcare companies, and this is probably a you know, distant fourth or further down right. the line. So, so a, a second tier. That's right. right. So right. when you're looking at investing in the healthcare, there are just so many good quality names that often Sonic gets overlooked. Yeah. Um, I think it's maybe the third largest um, operator in the world when it comes to laboratory testing. Um, at the moment, that's obviously got its perks with the coronavirus. Mm. I don't think anyone's testing more in Australia or Germany than Sonic, and they've also got um, presence in other countries as well. So that should help support or offset some of the lost business that they might get from um, other pathology tests that they have now had to with, with go, um, go without, sorry. Um, the problem for Sonic is, or they've done a very good job in diversifying overseas. Historically, they were more of an Australia-focused and centric yeah. business. And going back about three, four years ago, there was a land grab of sorts. There was deregulation of the pathology industry, which allowed these centres to be moved in suburbia away from central hubs. But what that ended up doing was putting up pressure on rents in these key locations. Mm -hmm. So it actually eroded their margins a little bit that way. I think the reason it trades on lower multiples as well to some of the other healthcare names is there's an element of political risk as well because it is such a key industry pathology testing I think there's the perception that costs have to be regulated somewhat or, or the pricing. Oh. So in one way, they've got capped revenue growth by the government, and then they've got all these other cost pressures coming from rents, um, expansion overseas, other competitors in the space yep. as well. So it probably isn't as good of a, a business fundamentally than some of these other names. And for that reason, oh. it's an avoid or just... Right. It's not, not, not an, I'm not going to go short sell it or anything today, but <laughs> I just saying, would not, prefer not other ones in the not space, a not a buy, yep. um, and probably not even a hold either because I'll be preferring to look elsewhere. Okay. All right. Um, our fit stock today is uh, we're going to go from health sector to financial and uh, QBE insurance. Um, what do you reckon, uh, Michael? QBE insurance mm -hmm. has 
it's sort of been a bit of a roller coaster over the yeah. years, has it? <laughs> well, it's been one of like the, the stockbrokers' favourites. You always get these big price targets, the turnarounds yeah. coming, a new CEO, a new board, and it starts to build expectations, and then it's tanks. Uh, something comes out of left field, yeah. and I think that's just what you get um, in the insurance industry. And for that reason, it's up there with the material space and the energy space in sectors that we avoid. Right. Um, the environment, basically, the business model for insurance companies is somewhat simple in that they take people's premiums, they pull together all those premiums and then they invest those premiums and try and earn an investment return on those premiums, meeting their obligations along the way. We're in, a, in a, an environment globally at the moment with financial markets where it's very difficult to eke out decent returns with low risk assets. Obviously bond yields are very low, negative in some parts of the world. Yeah. Corporate debt, is come, the, the, the margins have come down, the spreads have come down there. Obviously equity markets have been turbulent. So it's becoming increasingly more difficult for these insurance companies to meet their obligations as easily as they could in the past. Um, then obviously you've got the unknown events yeah. such when as natural disaster, weather and disasters, and, et cetera. Yeah. So for us, there's just too many variables. It's a challenging environment for them investment wise. One thing that was going in their favour was that insurance premiums globally were moving higher before the crisis. How the crisis impacts insurance premiums going forward probably is anyone's guess at the yeah. moment. So although insurance is considered to be quite conservative and that the industry will always be there, there's a big requirement for insurance, it's just hard for these companies to be profitable consistently just because of all the different variables that are at play yeah. there and, and all the unknown factors as well. Yeah. So just to recap, um, uh, Michael and um, uh, Andrew's views on oil search, both a no on that. Uh, CSL, great Australian company, if you can get under 300 bucks for it. Um, attractive, hold on Fisher and Paykel, hold on Cochlear, no uh, from uh, Michael on Sonic uh, Healthcare. Um, bit of a yes, I think, from, from Andrew on Sonic the pathology group and a no for QBE. So let's get into the second half of the call and kick it off in the um, the building, construction, development business. Lind Lease, another great Australian sort of top 200 company. And Michael, it is one of those stocks that when they go into a, a big project and get it wrong, that's it right. goes really wrong, doesn't it? As, well, that, that's as the we've concern. seen in the UK for them. And... That's right. And even they had a division, which they've still got on their books that they're trying to sell, which is involved in engineering and services division. Yeah. Um, that was the big fall that you saw at the back end of 2018, where they were having sort of huge write downs on some of those projects. They vowed to sell that business, but they haven't found a buyer yet. And that keeps getting pushed out. So ultimately, right. that will be, I think, net positive once that part of the business um, has been rid of. Um, but ultimately, look, it's a lumpy style of business because like you say, they get one project, they deliver it on time and on budget, they get a nice boost. Yeah. Um, then they've got to keep going to the, the well, if you like, and replenishing themselves. So for us, it makes it difficult to value. Um, you would think as well that if there was a big hit to the commercial real estate market, residential real estate market, Lend Lease wouldn't be in the best position in that sort of environment. Um, they do have a fair bit of cash on their balance sheet and they've got the Tower One in Barangaroo just down the road mm -hmm. from where we are at the moment. There's been talk of maybe a partial sell down of that to free up some cash at this part of the cycle so that they can then look at picking off some projects in the next you know, 12, 18 months or so once things settle. Um, but from our point of view, it's a too cyclical business to get invested in and it's very yeah. difficult to predict. They raised a few eyebrows with their capital raising recently. It was at a huge discount. I mean, the shares were only $18 not that long ago. They ended up raising money below $10. Um, that ended up being a sort of 15% dilutive to earnings per share. It did reduce their leverage somewhat, which isn't the worst thing in this environment. But yeah, if, look, from our perspective, you could do worse than Lend Lease if you wanted to be in that construction space. But we just, again, find it quite challenging. And often, when you least expect it, something comes out of left field, right. uh, which is not ideal. Okay, all right, so a note for Lend Lease. <clears throat> Mind you, they're, they're terrific landlords um, here at Tower 3 of Barangaroo, uh, <laughs> where Ausbiz has its studios. Um, but yeah, a no, no for both of them. Um, our seventh stock out of the 10 that you suggested we look at today is Blue Scope. Blue Scope Steel. Blue Scope management need to be commended really on turning that business around. If you take that five year chart and take it back 10 mm. years, you'll see that this was a business that was very much on its knees. In um, a tough sector, isn't tough, it, with global competitors? That's right. So the heavyweights, China and the yeah. US in steel. So 
Blue Scope really lacks any competitive advantage. Um, they really lack any control over their pricing either. And for that reason, we wouldn't ever buy it. But they've definitely done a good job in a tough situation. Yep. Uh, they capitalised on the housing boom that occurred in Australia going back a couple of years ago. But that positive will now probably turn to a bit of a negative for some period of time. They did manage to diversify their business model away from just pure raw steel to things like Colourbon, which mm. is used in a lot of building projects and houses, etc. So look, they've done a lot right, but it's just a business that operates in a little old Australia competing against many of the global heavyweights. And for that reason, it's always going to find itself or at times find itself being yeah. squeezed from different angles. Because you don't have the scale. That's or right. The you're scale. behind the global market. That's right. They, have done, they did end up setting up a plant in the US, um, again, which made them more competitive and they made them able to produce steel at more competitive prices, but that's only one small part of a, a bigger business. Right, okay. All right, so I know for Blue Scope. Gents, thank you for that. Uh, sort of very quickly running out of time, just a quick recap on the last five. No for Lend Lease. No for Blue Scope, no for Can Fluence, speculative buy from uh, from Andrew because he knows the business um, and has done some work into it. Uh, no for Clunaville. And also Michael Wayne from Medallion Financial. Michael, good to see you. No, thanks for having me and I'll see you soon. Uh, that's it for the call for today. Really appreciate your time. Don't forget, if you do want to send in any suggestions for the call in days to come, you can email uh, the call at ausbiz.com.au or through Twitter at ausbiz.tv. Great.